Welcome to Leveling America. We are the National Association of Scholars in conjunction with the John Locke Society and the uh, Martin Center. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Uh, this is a report release, and our report is titled Social Justice in America. You are either holding it in your hands or sitting on top of it, so uh, it should be easily available. We have an all-star lineup for you today. Uh, we're bringing in Elizabeth Warren to moderate. Uh, we will have uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Ortez as our first speaker, followed by Maxine Waters and Bill McKibben. And <laughs> Melissa Click will be stopping by a little bit later on. So um, I hope you look forward to that as much as I do. Uh, obviously, social justice is a divisive issue in America. Uh, and in fact, we are a divided country. If you're in this room, you're probably sitting on one side of that divide and not the other. Uh, and that makes this, I guess, a safe space. So welcome to our safe space. Um, the word justice, I do not think, is necessarily improved by adding the adjective social in front of it. Uh, in fact, it might be diminished by that adjective in that it seems to imply that good old justice is limited to matters of criminal law and uh, personal lawsuits and things like that. I don't think that's necessarily the case. We've had some advice of long standing. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the case of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. That's from a guy named Isaiah. And then let justice fall down like waters. Isaiah and Amos did not seem to think they needed to say social justice. There is certainly a sense in which uh, oppression happens that we live in a world in which uh, various forms of injustice take place. Some of those involve race and sex and the sorts of things that greatly exercise the proponents of social justice, but I don't think that we have to frame it in the terms that they frame it. Uh, the use of the term social justice these days is a kind of mm, on-ramp to the promotion of a kind of authoritarianism. It's a way of saying that certain people know what justice is without having to bother with such things as due process or the search for truth. They just know what it is. Um, now, knowing what it is without searching for the proof is not what the National Association of Scholars is all about. I should introduce us as a group. Uh, we're about 32 years old. We're founded uh, back in the 1980s as an effort to push back what, against what then seemed to be a pretty flimsy movement called political correctness. Uh, we, or our founders, made some bad bets on that. It had more staying power than we thought, and thus we have moved on over the years and found ourselves from once having been a mainstream organization in favor of what everybody was in favor of, to being a rather marginalized organization in favor of uh, things, classical verities, that now are in a hard place. We have taken in the last 10 years a new tactic, which has been to try to build a broad coalition among the American people by bringing forward ideas that were percolating on campus, but which not yet had reached the mainstream. So uh, early on, we identified something called the sustainability movement. This was back in uh, 2008. And when we studied the so sustainability movement, we thought we were getting into something about environmental activism, but we very quickly discovered that environmental activism was uh, connected to economic and social justice issues. They usually drew this as a big Venn diagram, and the thing that they were searching for had less to do with the environment than with a kind of uh, soft pitch for socialism. Since then, we've moved on to about a dozen other reports, some of which you've probably uh, made some glancing acquaintance with. Uh, David, the author of Social Justice in Education in America report, previously did a study titled Making Citizens, How American Universities Teach Civics. 
is something called the New Civics out there, which is uh, a way of promoting turning students into citizens of the world rather than citizens of their own country, and along the way becoming social activists. Well, the road from making citizens to social justice education in America is a fairly short one, but the road to making this report is a rather long one, and I should uh, you know, pay homage here to where it came from. Back in 2011, I met with uh, Mr. Arthur Roop, a uh, individual who had acquired a fair amount of wealth. He was in his 90s, and when I talked to him about social justice on campus, he knew exactly what I meant. I said social justice is the new wraparound term that the American left is using for all the issues that it's concerned about, and it tries to take this term to give them a kind of spurious unity. So whether we're interested in uh, uh, unionizing the cafeteria workers or getting transgendered people the right to use bathrooms, it's all social justice and you have common cause there through the magic word of intersectionality. Well, uh, I convinced Arthur to fund the project, and I was confident that within a year or so we could have a nice thick description of how social justice was playing out. I had bit off uh, the toe of a, of a dinosaur. This thing was just way too big for us, and it went through staff member after staff member for almost 10 years until finally David was able to synthesize this, partly by paring down our database to 60 colleges, and making sure we had full representation of the country, and partly just because he is a dogged worker who just doesn't give up when he gets an assignment. So thank you, David, for making this happen. Uh, and I pass on the gratitude of uh, Mr. Arthur Roop, who's now at the age 102, very happy to see the fruits of uh, his investment in my, my promises of a, a decade ago, almost a decade ago. Um, well, uh, others will have more to say about what exactly goes into the uh, social justice laundry bale as we proceed. Uh, I want to thank those who have helped make this happen. Um, the Pope Foundation, President uh, John Hood has graciously helped us find this birth here at the John Locke Foundation. And I want to thank uh, Corey Swanson for his help in making this available too. Jenna Robinson, who will speak after me, is president of the Martin Center and is co-sponsoring this event. Um, and the Rube Foundation, of course, uh, uh, is the funder of the work that we put into this. The world of justice seems to me to be one of just crucial importance to anybody who seeks an education. Uh, not so long ago, most college freshmen took some kind of course where they might read uh, Plato's Republic, which spends about 500 pages or so trying to dissect what the notion of justice is. We don't assume that justice is a simple and transparent idea. And the more complicated notion of justice for all, which is promised in the United States has its own complications to it. Clearly, there are inequities in our society. Not everybody every day has the same access to goods and services as everybody else. Is that a matter of justice, or is that a matter of the marketplace sorting things out? I think that those are important to discussions to have, but not through this ideological lens of social justice, which doesn't assume that there's any room for conversation. It assumes that the answers are readily apparent. Um, the program we have ahead for you today, unfortunately, does not include AOC and Maxine Waters. They weren't able to make it. Uh, but we found some other pretty good people to fill in for them, uh, starting with Jenna, who will uh, give her greetings in a moment. Then David is going to give his uh, synopsis of his labors on this report. And then our keynote speaker, Heather McDonald, who is in the room, will speak after that. Heather is the William Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and uh, is usually met when she speaks on campuses by certain people who would prefer that she not speak on campus. Uh, if you're here today to shout her down, you're going to be pretty lonely, I'm afraid. Uh, after Heather speaks, we will have a Q&A. We also have copies of her new book available for sale and she will sign them. Then we will take a break 
and move on to the afternoon panel, which I will introduce later. Um, so welcome to this event, and I look forward to the exciting discussions that will follow. Heather? No. <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm just going to speak very briefly, so I'll just I'll hold the mic here. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm sorry I don't have any jokes for you, um, but thank you for coming. We're really happy to see all of you here in North Carolina. Thank you to our speakers for taking the time to come to Raleigh and share your knowledge and expertise. And I also want to thank the John Locke Foundation for lending us this beautiful space and helping us get it ready for you all today. Uh, as Peter said, I'm Jenna Robinson. I'm the president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. And I know some of you here today, but also some of you I know came here because you uh, heard about the event through the National Association of Scholars. And so I want to take a moment to tell you about the Martin Center. Um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, public policy organization here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We were established in 2003, and we are named after a former governor of North Carolina, James G. Martin. He is on our board. Um, and the Martin Center tackles, like the National Association of Scholars, some of the most stubborn problems in higher education. Uh, our purpose is to renew and fulfill the promise that higher education has made to Americans for many years. Uh, and we want to do that here in North Carolina and beyond. We are dedicated to promoting knowledge over credentials. We want to restore genuine liberal learning and make sure that people actually know what general, genuine liberal learning means and that liberal in this case does not mean left of center. Uh, we want to ensure that public investment in higher education bears fruit both for students and for the citizens and taxpayers who make that investment. And we do that by working to create change at the state and local level. We have some specific things that we're particularly interested in. We're interested in academic quality, in transparent and responsible governance, cost-effective education solutions, innovations, athletics, and viewpoint diversity, which I think is of particular interest today because, as Peter mentioned, the social justice movement doesn't really allow for viewpoint diversity. They, they think that everything has the same answer and that there shouldn't be much debate about it. So I'm delighted to be a part of this program today. I'm delighted that the Martin Center was able to co-host with our friends at the National Association of Scholars. Thank you all for suggesting coming down here to Raleigh and presenting to this audience um, because this really is an important topic. The philosophy of social justice has been a pernicious and growing force on campus, which I know David's report is going to show. Uh, and for many faculty and students, it has replaced the search for truth as their reason for being and their primary educational goal. And I'm excited to learn more from our speakers today about exactly what is occurring on our campuses. I've obviously, you know, if you read the headlines, you already know some of what is going on, but I think David has probably cataloged a lot more of it. And I hope especially some of our panelists in the afternoon will be able to share with us some success stories of what has been done to combat it. And so I'm, I'm actually pretty excited that we're ending up with the panel because I, I think David is probably going to depress us. <laughs> and so our panelists will be able to share a few things that have worked to stem the tide somewhat. So again, thank you all for being here and I'm excited to let David kick us off. Um, thank you again to the John Locke Foundation, to the James Martin Center, to the Roop Foundation. Uh, thank you everybody for showing up. Um, it's lovely to see you here. Thank you for assigning me to this task. <laughs> so, um, one of the goals of activists is always to create more activists. Now, the social justice movement in American edu higher education may, may aim at bringing about a golden age of fairness in America, but it indisputably claims, aims, at creating more social justice activists. Now, they used to re revel in the term social justice warriors, but 
that last word has triggered the peace-loving Antifa of sorts and is now taken as hate speech. So I'll stick with the term activists. Duke University diverts tuition and tenure to steer jobs to social justice activists by forcing students to take a cross-cultural inquiry course, which, quote, encourages critical and responsible attention to issues of identity, diversity, globalization, and power. Uh, that means courses like organizing for equity, activism, and social change, and sounding Latinx, literature, listening, and ethno-racial othering in the U.S. The CCI requirement doesn't just steer jobs to activists, it also forces students to sign up for social justice propaganda. Wake Forest University's Residential Engagement Communities program tempts students with the Community Engagement Theme House, where we function as a home away from home that builds community and works to broaden what we define as community, while engaging in talks about the intersections of social justice and community. Social justice colonizes the dormitory. Elon University's Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Diversity Education boasts about its intergroup dialogue, an interactive co-curricular experience designed to increase students' awareness about diversity and activism for social justice. The co-curriculum at Elon means administers, administrators training students to create action plans for more social justice, Elon. That's just a sampling uh, from North Carolina's self-licking lollipop of social justice education, the activism geared to create more activists. Now, all my examples today will be from the Tar Heel State, but social justice education engulfs nearly all of America's universities. Now, this revolution has come very fast. Um, my college set up its multicultural house you know, when I was a student. Um, I could avoid it. My graduate history program already had a center for race and ethnicity and, uh, when, when I arrived there, and I think that they sponsored a majority of the guest lectures in the department. When I went on the job market, colleges asked me for a diversity statement, and I didn't have a choice if I wanted a job. Social justice education took over the university in just one generation. University presidents sell social justice to the public as all-American niceness. You know, the Federal Trade Commission ought to book them for false advertising. At UNC Charlotte, social justice means the Office of Identity, Equity, and Engagement in the Division of Student Affairs. And when they run a white consciousness conversation about how racism is perpetuated individually, culturally, and systemically. By the way, it's always systemic, never systematic. It's an odd little usage. UNC's Chapel Hill Campus Y, that used to be the YMCA, um, and that's also in, been swallowed up by the Division of Student Affairs, they blare at students that the fight for social justice takes many forms, direct service, education, advocacy, and activism. Dig down into social justice on campus and you'll find the radical political agenda of identity politics, multiculturalism, and safe spaces. Social justice's long history traces back through John Rawls to 19th century Catholic theologians who embodied, embedded social justice in Catholicism's joyful faith in redemption. 
social justice in America in 2019 means the radical secular theory that ordinary American life is so oppressive that we must dedicate ourselves to liberating others from that oppression. Oppression means the unjust social relations that work to perpetuate society's unfair distribution of goods and burdens. And goods, that includes income, employment opportunities, wealth, property ownership, housing, education, access to health care, transportation, child care services, personal safety, access to political power, political participation, social recognition, recreation, and the right to a healthy and pleasant environment. And just to go ahead a little bit, you need to believe that all of this needs to be changed for studying anything from accounting to zoology. I mean, we start here, we end up there. The oppressed liberate themselves to redistribute all these goods by splitting into identity groups who will fight to revolutionize the mechanisms of political participation, workplace decision-making processes, the division of labor, and the overall organization of society, as well as the culture that pervades it. Everything. Um, those with privilege must reject their privilege by becoming the silent, deferential allies of the oppressed. Liberation comes first. Everything else comes second, including liberty, the Constitution, and the free market. You must dedicate every aspect of life to achieving social justice, and any opposition is immoral and must be crushed. That means that if you complain when the people who hate you steal your money and your liberty, they stuff a gag in your mouth because you deserve it, and then they open your wallet again. Social justice education applies social justice theory to our schools. In higher education, this means overhauling the university to support social justice and its aims. The words vary. Diversity, inclusion, equity, multiculturalism, sustainability, civic engagement. But the goal is the same. Regulations, classwork, extracurriculars, dorm life, hiring, publications for tenure. Social justice educators yoke every part of campus life to social justice. They degrade education's search for truth into the pursuit of power. Now, social justice educators don't have to conspire in secret. They've captured the university just playing hardball administrative politics. This is a national movement. Social justice advocates campaign to create an environment where they can monopolize higher education administration and the professoriate for themselves. First, the social justice cadres warp university and department mission statements to trumpet dedication to social justice. UNC, Chapel Hill, uh, commits itself to diversity and inclusivity Elon University's School of Education declares that its mission is to prepare educators who are advocates for social justice. Appalachian State University prepares students to lead purposeful lives as engaged global citizens. Once a university or a department officially dedicates itself to social justice, concrete programs follow. Appalachian State's social justice mission justifies a host of concrete programs. Um, diversity and inclusion at Appalachian State, diversity celebration, and the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Compliance. And well, there's a lot more. Uh, we're just, I'm just getting started. Uh, there's also sustainable development, social justice and university housing, 
a social justice and action fund and Appalachian social justice educators. And I must say, actually, a very long paragraph followed from which I've just extracted that. I mean, I, I could have had the entire 20 minute speech on that. Um, a social justice mission statement is a dragon's tooth. Sew it in a campus and overnight, there is a host of new bureaucrats armed with regulations. Next, the social justice cadres seize control of general education requirements. At Barton College, students must take a course in intercultural perspectives. At East Carolina University, they force students to acquire global and domestic diversity competencies. At Davidson College, students must pay for one course in cultural diversity and another in justice, equality, and community. They have to take courses such as art, sorry, art activism, and environment, Latinx sexual dissidence and guerrilla translation, oppression and education, and theater for social justice. Many social justice requirements double count to fulfill humanities and social sciences requirements as well. The double counting steers students to social justice courses in the humanities and social sciences. Dictating these education requirements makes sure that students are subjected to social justice propaganda and guarantees that more and more social justice educators get hired. Requiring social justice courses carves out an enormous number of tenure track jobs for social justice advocates. There are whole departments in social justice dedicated to vocational training in left-wing activism. Elon University boasts a poverty and social justice minor, and UNC Chapel Hill a social and economic justice minor. Experiential learning courses throughout the academy replace classroom study with work for outside organizations, vocational training for left-wing activism. At UNC Chapel Hill, experiential learning means courses like environmental advocacy, and social and economic justice. Experiential learning gets called civic engagement, service learning, global learning. Whatever the name, you get course credit to learn how to be an activist. Soon these courses will be the bread and butter of college education. So the good news is that colleges have finally listened to the NAS when we said they should bring back core curricula. The bad news is that the new core is social justice education. <laughs> Outside the classroom, a host of higher education administrators impose social justice through the so-called co-curriculum. Offices such as student life, residential life, first year experience, service learning, and diversity. They do so not least because their own professional organizations already embrace social justice. The National Association of Student Personnel Administrators affirms the importance and centrality of the values of equity, inclusion, and social justice to student affairs professionals. A higher education administrator who doesn't spread the applesauce of social justice is ashamed because he thinks he isn't doing his job properly. And so, at Appalachian State University, the Division of Student Affairs pays for the Intersect Social Justice Retreat designed to help educate participants about the concepts of social justice and leadership through exploration of their own stories, the stories of others, and issues of oppression and privilege. At Duke, the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity funds the Cook Center Media Workshop in which students direct, edit, and produce videos that highlight issues of social and economic inequality in North Carolina. 
UNC Chapel Hill's Student Affairs Office gave its annual diversity award to Housing and Residential Education for setting up a tunnel of oppression. At least there's truth in advertising. The social justice that infests the co-curriculum really is a tunnel of oppression. UNC Chapel Hill's Diversity Award to Housing and Residential Education. When you hear housing, you know social justice advocates also cram social justice into dorm life. Appalachian State University's University Housing pledges itself to social justice and diversity by way of a social justice committee, training workshops, a transgender housing policy, and social justice professional development. UNC Asheville's Community Engagement and Social Responsibility Living Learning Community exhorts students to learn multiple strategies for promoting social change. At Elon University, the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Diversity Education sponsors the African Diasporas, Diasporas LLC, and the Center for Access and Success sponsors the Examining Disparities in Access to Education, LLC, uh, Living Learning Community. Sponsorship means bureaucrats using campus housing to recruit the next generation of social justice advocates. Today's freshman peer educator is tomorrow's social justice dean. Tomorrow, everyone who works for a university will be a social justice advocate. University job advertisements increasingly require commitment to social justice. Duke University's human resources swears fealty to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Davidson College's advertisement for an assistant director for civic engagement declared that the job focuses on the intersection of civic engagement and social justice issues. UNC Greensboro wants an assistant professor of program evaluation whose research agendas will have clear connections to equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice, or cultural responsiveness. All jobs in higher education will be preempted for the 8% of the country that believes in social justice theory. Social justice makes higher education half 1984 and half Tammany Hall. Self-criticism sessions out of Mao's China all mixed up with jobs for the boys. The National Association of Scholars gives Americans a series of recommendations at the end of our report. Uh, social justice, justice education in America, um, about how to defend higher education from social justice advocates. The most important suggestion is to recognize that we don't just face individual social justice advocates in each college, but a nationwide movement to impose social justice orthodoxy and train social justice activists. We also need to know that their tactics aim above all to secure stable careers for social justice advocates. Our own tactics have to aim at disrupting higher education's ability to sustain social justice careers. Above all, state legislatures should use their powers to keep social justice advocates from securing safe careers in our public universities. We don't need to remove every social justice advocate from higher education. We just need to shift incentives so that the average would-be social justice advocate decides to pursue a different career. If we can manage that, half the battle is won. Will the reign of social justice be a golden age? I doubt it. But I think that it is pretty clear that the reign of social justice advocates will require a lot of gold, 
mostly in the form of transfers from America's taxpayers to the pockets of the social justice advocates themselves. Curb those financial incentives and the social justice movement will look a lot like the statue of Ozymandias in Shelley's poem. Two vast and chunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. That's it. Are we having a Q&A for me now, or are we having Heather now? What's the precise order? Q&A now. Q&A now. I will keep my microphone. Questions? Sir. So, like, one of the, one of the, mis one of the points you make in saying that you're an AIF to, um, was the enchanted tree from Chapter 3 by Salt. Well, in perverse, in, in trade unions, the perverse incentive is not to send warriors in higher education or to positions of administration in higher education. How do you do that without becoming a sort of new thought force? I'm sorry, I'm sorry how, how do you how do you how do you do that? How do you create incentives or something without like inherently policing or doing some kind of like libertarian paternalism or something? Like how do you tread that line, I guess? Because I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I love your idea, but it just seems like creating these systems or just creating systems on the back end of already messed up systems in order to police in the other side to get more like holistic folks would want in there, but still police it. The simplest answer, I think, is define closely what an edu what a, every, a position in a university is supposed to do. Simply say that it, it doesn't include any of the political stuff that they, people should simply focus, you know, the accounting professor should focus on accounting, you know, housing, you know, for somebody in residential life should focus on making sure that the sheets are clean. Um, make sure that the job definitions are tight and don't allow for politicization. Um, I don't want the Rockefeller Republican thought police either. Um, be interesting you know, alternate universe where it existed, but you know, no, I don't want it. Um, you are correct that it is a danger to watch for, but we cannot at this point do nothing against a system which is institutionally veering, veered wildly towards authoritarian, illiberal you know, social justice. I guess I would say make the definitions tight, make the money carefully tight, state legislatures above all, define what you are allowed to do, and that will, I think, do a great deal to fix the problem without setting up a counter-thought police. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, a couple of questions. Number one, do you see social justice warriors infecting the hard sciences and engineering, for example, you mentioned the humanities. Um, we want to get on a plane designed by a social justice warrior. <laughs> and, and secondly, are there any, did you come across any colleges, universities where this, um, where they're, which are more traditional, I guess you could say, in their approach, something like Hillsdale, or did, did you find any other schools like that where social justice just hasn't quite gotten in there yet? So for the first one, it's coming into the sciences. Uh, we actually have a section on social justice mathematics. It's worst, if you like, for teaching you know, K to 12 teachers of science and math to be make sure that you cannot learn biology without learning social justice, you know, or as I say, or algebra. You know, there are courses, San Francisco State University, algebra and social justice, statistics and social justice. I think Pomona had a statistics and social justice also. So, it's coming in. There are also increasing number of courses on, not just you know, in the environmental studies program, but indeed all of the sciences, there's an increasing carve out. Um, so it's started, and I am terribly afraid it will get much worse. We deliberately didn't do Hillsdale because it was so atypical. Um, a number of the ones we had are less gotten by it. Uh, we did like Belmont University, um, Evangelical in Tennessee. They've got some stuff, 
you know, social, you know, a social justice study abroad in Australia, like mathematics and social justice by the coral reefs or what have you, um, you know, service learning and what have you. So everywhere we went, it had there was some. It's thickest at places like Northwestern, San Francisco State University, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. One thing I actually want to add, which is I think a, a way to answer this. Part of the way that social justice gets forward is through the accreditation programs. Um, the Higher Learning Commission is perhaps the worst, but all of them. But what this means is even a university that is not necessarily dead set on this is being forced to impose a social justice bureaucracy by the accreditation process. So even the reluctant will be forced to conform. Um. I'm curious about the double counting that you mentioned as far as like uh, classes and how they count for students. So, you know, if you're taking like an accounting class or say you're taking something else that's very structured and classic, you know, I was a finance major at Rutgers in New Jersey and stuff like that. So I don't see how, how do you double, how do they get the, the uh, if you have any specific examples of that, like how do you get like a, a social liberal kind of class to get six credits where you, you get people to kind of, it's like, wow, it's six credit credits, let's class, let's go in there and, you know, we'll knock it out, we get more credit and stuff like that. How is that even, I mean, how is that even legal to do, like, in a college? Like, I don't get that. And how much data do you have on that? Uh, well, okay, there, there's, like, yeah. uh, huge amounts here plus the charts. Um, you can, you'll, you'll find a whole section there. I'm not going to open the book this second. What you have is, you have, say, the natural sciences and mathematics requirement. You have a um, you know, diversity requirement. Diversity includes activism for environmental advocacy amongst communities of color, and that counts, and that's put uh, as counting also for the science requirement. So, and of course, everybody wants to get stuff out of their way easily, so I'm this random person who's not totally interested in sciences. Uh, I don't really want to take organic chemistry, uh, so I take uh, environmental advocacy instead, and I've knocked off both my diversity and my science requirement. Um, it's most effective in hollowing out the humanities and the social sciences. It also is affecting the hard sciences. Again, it's not as bad yet, but in effect, I hate to say this, lots of people will only take the minimum of humanities and social science courses, and it really is working out that half or more of the required courses will be done uh, by social justice, you know, you know, art and activism theater. So, you know, rather than, you know, history of the United States one or history of Western civilization one. You know. um, so for those, it's I think half or more, and again, crucially, the tenure lines. Tenure lines, above all, are for the guaranteed courses. The guaranteed courses are the ones that meet the general education requirements. The double counting is this marvelously brilliant way of reserving the vast majority of tenure lines for social justice advocates. Yeah. And sir. Yeah. Add to what that speaker said or the, the question he said before. Yes, it's in engineering. It is just so different in the last 10 years from 20 years. 20 years ago, you didn't detect any of it. Now you pretty much can't go to any conference in science or engineering without seeing something on social justice, inclusion, and so forth. You can ignore it if you want. And most of the presentations aren't on it. But the, feel, the feeling is the conference uh, leadership knows that it's their job to promote that to the attendees. And it's just really very, very sad and kind of scary. But my question is, what can the individual faculty member do, or in conjunction with other like-minded faculty, do to resist this without being in the administration? Oh, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Uh, stick to your, all right, be a stickler to the faculty guidebook and rules such as they are. Look up the rules, try to make sure that nobody's slipping, slipping things w against the rules. Um, they will be changing the rule books as fast as they can, but try to do that. 
publicity, the NAS, uh, can help and embarrass uh, some of the more egregious stuff, although you know, the, the numbers of the shameless grow all the time. Um, I do think that speaking up and writing letters, above all, actually, to the state representatives, the legislators, that actually is remarkably effective. A large number of legislators do say, we never hear from any faculty at all. There is no one who will give an opposing you know, version of this. If we have even one letter, it helps an enormous amount. Um, so I think targeted letter writing to state officials, federal officials, um, it's not a waste of time. It's not useless. It will have an effect. And I must say, um, perhaps a greater effect than going, you're know, banging your head against the university bureaucracy. Yeah, to add something to that. I, it's not easy to do, but taking a stand does work. There are people who refuse to sign a diversity statement or make that annual report on what they've done to promote social justice. Um, I deal with people like that all over the country right now. They get friction, but they seldom lose their jobs. They, it's a, it's a risk in, involved. You might find your next sabbatical leave uh, delayed or canceled, or you might not get uh, the office that you coveted. But nonetheless, there's a, for a fair number of people, a sense of integrity overcomes their reluctance to uh, stick their necks out. And if enough people started doing that, it would make a difference. Right now, there are people who are doing it, who get written up in the Chronicle of Higher Education or inside higher ed, the sort of the industry rags. They're not written up with admiration, but they're being noticed. And their being noticed there means they're going to be noticed elsewhere as well. So. Uh, I do think uh, summoning your courage to take a stand is uh, a good thing. If you're here in this room, you probably already have an unusually uh, large degree of such courage, so take heart. I, I just want to actually add to that quickly. Bruce Gilley, Portland State University, president of the Oregon Association of Scholars, our state affiliate, now new member of our board, he's been on a one-man mission to do everything he can in Portland State and in Oregon Look at what the Oregon Association of Scholars is doing. Look at what Bruce Gilley is doing. He is truly inspirational. I wanted to ask about whether it's possible, you think, on the basis of your, your uh, research, to let, build on what I hope, maybe this is aspirational, are some residual uh, glimmers of hope uh, within, among young people, well, the two areas, one on the hiring side and the other on the young people themselves. Uh, my younger son graduated from Davidson about 12 years ago. It's about the time Silenus was just beginning to get traction. Uh, I talked to him and those in his class and find out there's an encouraging number, I don't know if they're a minority or a majority, who when asked about these trends will smile and shrug and say, oh, of course we hear it all the time. But frankly, we don't really take it, take it terribly seriously. They, 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 they get along now. So, a percentage of them will make it through their education without having uh, drunk Kool-Aid and will go on to lead a, <laughs> what's that? And so, again, I, I wonder if it's possible to, if we can, in, in countering and in modifying the patterns of incentives, we can build on that and, and, and avoid the risk of over, or mischaracterizing the extent to which undergraduate population you know, is bought into that. And then at the same time, look at the other side. There is a big part of the, the economy and the society are going to be voting with their hiring, with their HR departments, on the types of skills and dispositions and knowledge. And it, for the most part, with some notable exceptions, you got to know something. you got to do something. And so at some point, working with both the existing sentiments, you know, with the young people, who after all, are not dummies, they're not, and, and the cognitive dissonance is, you know, they, they can recognize 
maybe with underground copies, I'm just, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, circulated copies of Plato's Republic or Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's really something here. So, what kind of data do you have? It'd be nice to have some longitudinal data available all the time about some trends here, about leveraging what's <laughs> residual sanity, and that, or, as Jonah Goldberg says, there's got to be a remnant there we can work with. Well, I, I, I think. So I, I preach alarm. Um, no, but seriously, I, I do think in, I think that being confident has unfortunately led to greater and greater successes by the social justice warriors. The trend was there were you know, zero, and there are now a tremendous number. Among other things, one of the main career tracks for a social justice advocate is actually human resources. Uh, it's taking over the corporations precisely that way. We, you know, not only you know, reserved hires uh, for, to, to get rid of oppression and so forth, but you know, the endless you know, propaganda, you know, um, you know, seminars and retreats and so on. The people who make their living don't just do it on the universities, they do it for the big corporations. Um, I, I, there is also, I'm afraid, an awful lot of people, if they're not exposed to anything else, they simply think that this is normal. You know, I'm doing engineering, I'm doing accounting, and of course the social justice assumptions, that's normal. Be and not only, and even more so because the social justice advocates go very strongly and heavily into the schools of education and K-12 education, people are now coming into the colleges formed by the same education from kindergarten onwards. Um, I guess I would say, I think that more active measures are indeed necessary because the dynamic is, I think, unfortunately powerful. I think it's very important to actually do something. We have a problem in our state that the teachers can't pass the test to uh, you know, complete their credential. Mostly they can't pass the math test. They probably took counting sheep 101 instead of the real math and then um, got credit for it. But they can't, te you know, they can't pass the test. How are they teaching our children math? So you know, that the double counting could be something that can come back to haunt us and hurt our, our children, not just uh, I mean, I, I, I think that indeed our children, the troubles with education uh, in America over the last uh, several generations, this, this is indeed part of the problem. It has already massively hurt you know, the basic you know, ability to read and write. I speak nothing of knowing the history of the country. Sorry. To, to expand on that just briefly, um, this is, I realize this focus is college and higher education, but this is starting in elementary school, and by the time they get to college, they're fully indoctrinated, virtually anyway. But, um, I don't think there was a question. <laughs> Is there anything being done about that? Well, well, we did have an earlier report, was that 2007 or so, on schools of education? I mean, in effect, the schools of education are ab absolutely crucial. I might say one thing that's terribly important is teacher licensure requirements. If you can require K-12 you know, teachers to actually know something and not just get away with the latest social justice classes, I mean, if, force, them to t force them to learn mathematics and history and science, give them such stiff requirements, there's no time left for the social justice nonsense. That's the best thing you can do. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, quick question. Uh, <laughs> uh, the direct financial burden of social justice general education requirements is at least ten billion a year nationwide and rising fast. Where did you get that figure? How did you come up with it? Cost. Uh, the cost for how much it costs on average to take a required course. Uh, you know, in effect, in effect, going by if you take one diver diversity requirement, multiculturalism requirement, social justice requirement course experiential learning, cost of that, call it 2,000 bucks, multiply it by every student in the nation. That's your own figure. Yeah. That's your own. Yeah. yeah. And, and I must say, I mean, that was trying to be 
unbelievably conservative. We made no attempt to talk about how much it costs to pay for you know, each dean of community engagement, each advocate for sustainability. Um, our next report on administrative growth will cover that, but the true figure must be much, much higher. That was trying to give an absolute bargain basement estimate. So, oh, sorry. I, actually, wait, wait. You were supposed to be next, Ben. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm just reading the end of your report and your recommendations for a solution to yeah. uh, social justice infiltration in academia, and you advocate um, advocate student non-cooperation. So I, I have uh, two questions, one for undergrads and one for grad students. Uh, since it's become so unavoidable for them to encounter some sort of requirement uh, related to social justice, and you recommend them not cooperating, my concern with for undergrads is it could be a grade at stake, it could be uh, student debt that they already have, uh, and they, that would be a concern that if they just left the university without a degree, they would have student debt. Uh, the concern for graduate student is the only way that they can get their graduate degree and hopefully contribute to a, a more reasonable uh, uh, point of view in the faculty is to get that PhD and to cooperate. Uh, so what's your, what's your thought on that? If, our young, if young Americans don't have the courage to stand for liberty and freedom, then they deserve not to be free. Um, if you're simply going to go along forever and do nothing, merely stolidly accept your fate, then you will lose all your freedom. There's students, and students need to do something. Frankly, they should be marching every single day to protest this and ask for, you know, this horde of parasites to be fired and to have their tuition remission. Uh, but short of that, graduate, leave, and go to your employers and say, I took all the real courses, I didn't take the fake courses. And indeed, you might if go to the university and say, give me my diploma, I got a real education, a better one than the one you wanted me to get. Um, they, students must not be helpless, students must take their fate into their own hands. This is what free Americans do. You and I discussed this a little before. The question was raised, what can faculty members do? And the price for being a dissident in this area is, is, can be very high indeed. But I think the one thing that they can do fairly safely is to raise the question of how social justice is defined. Initially, I think it was proportional representation. Now it's in increasingly reparations, but the advocates don't really want to state that because if they stated that nakedly, then a considerable part of the population would dissent from, uh, from proportional representation or reparations. On my own campus, when social justice began to be a term that I began to see in official documents, I wrote most of the major administrators and said, how, is, how are you defining this? Is there a campus definition of this term? Without dissent, all of them wrote back and said, we have, there is no definition. So then I said, well, where did it come from? They said, well, several people at conferences mentioned it. That was as far as it got. But if you press on the question of how are you defining this, I think that's a safe thing for faculties to do. And then when you see courses that don't reflect the definition that the campus is willing to admit to, then you have another leverage. Definitions would definitely help. <laughs> um, in the back sec. You talked about what professors and faculty can potentially do. My question is, what about those of us who are actually putting the bill? those of us taxpayers who are subsidizing here in North Carolina a dramatic amount of the cost of a student's tuition, those of us who are parents who write those tuition checks, what do we do? You mentioned uh, letters to legislators from faculty is effective. How do we as taxpayers and parents begin to refuse hiring these people and paying the bills for those who are seeking to destroy 
the very foundation of what we've worked so hard to create. I should say that I am not actually an expert in how exactly you get your state legislature to actually do something. Um, but I th having said that, write the letters to him, form the associations yourself, um, refuse to simply pay the tuition bill for your uh, kids to uh, take a nothing class. Um, but I think that you have to make it talk to the state legislators, organize to have a, a organization speaking to them and make it be a pr the priority. And that's I think the most crucial thing. The enemy is not just people who oppose what you want. The enemy is the alternate goods that people on your side want. And you have to say, no, we're not 10th on the list. We're, if not first, top three. Um, and you have to very gently elbow all the people who are your friends and aside and tell them, no, you need to focus on higher education first. Um, I'm not giving you, the, as I say, the precise things. All I can tell you is I believe the target is the state legislators. And the most crucial thing you need to say is pay attention to this and not the other good thing you want to do. Does that help? OK. Uh, sir. Yes. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Well, from the comment before about uh, the statement of purpose or the, the mission, mission statement, uh, Marx and Lenin and ch the chairman uh, all published something and said, this is what I stand for. Is there anybody who has any guts in this PC movement that uh, has written something and said, this is what social justice is and this is what we stand for? Millions. Everybody says it. I mean. There, but there is plausible deniability. So th there is no pope to uh, define what it is. You have thousands of different people with overlapping definitions. And if anybody you ever challenge somebody in one thing, then it, somebody else can say, oh, that's not precisely what we mean. Well, what do you mean? Well, something else. Um, there, there's no communist manifesto yeah. of, the, uh, of the movement. Uh, it is one of those things, like the diversity movement before it, it has no uh, uh, library of great thoughts. It has a slogan. It's really good at producing slogans. Um, it um, brings to the uh, table phrases that you hear over and over and over again, but they have no parents. There, there's nobody you can look to about it. You, you could, with social justice, probably go back to the uh, Harvard philosopher of the 1960s and 70s, John Rawls, and Rawls gets cited now and then, but the current social justice movement is not Rawlsian philosophy writ large. He's just a name that they can sometimes pull out of the hat if they're really pressed. But um, apart from that, the, the people who are the great spokesmen of this movement or people like AOC. You know, they're just ignorant people who have grabbed on to a bunch of phrases that uh, seem to resonate with a broader public. But I think our next yeah. speaker is yeah. going to be able to say a great deal more about that. Mm -hmm.